Good morning, everyone. We're excited to have you with us today. I'm Anton Sayalan, the Chief Evangelist for Luminary Learning Solutions, and I will be officiating the voice of the webinar this morning. Welcome to the Reset and Go webinar series, designed with the, mind, with the anticipation of getting everyone back on track in terms of mindset. And to set the right precedence, here is our disclaimer. We are not here to discuss the obvious. We are not here to dissect the impact. But we are here to contemplate the way forward. This is the basis on which the series was planned out and will flow over the next 10 days. We will commence our webinar shortly. Take house rules for those of us joining in for the first time. If you do wish to ask a question, please use the chat option at any point during the session. Similar questions will be clubbed together. The format of the webinar will be 40 minutes of discussion, followed by 20 minutes of Q&A. The topic for the day, keeping fit and healthy during this time. Well, with the lockdown in progress, the most exercise most of us seem to be getting are those the ever so frequent trips to the fridge. Once you get there, you stand there in the soft glow of the fridge light and wonder what you really want. The answer is simple, I guess. You're not hungry, you're bored. Well, we're taking a closer look this morning at keeping fit and healthy and why it is important to seize this crucial time being handed to us to unlearn the bad and learn the good. So keep a paper and pen handy. You may want to take notes. Our guest this morning, Asarin the Nambwe, CEO Mas Prida and Director Mas Carol Gore, Murtaza, Murtaza Izifali, Managing Director Morrison's PLC and Executive Director Hemas Holding, Professor Nalika Gunnavardhana, National Professional Officer, Non-Communicable Diseases and Health Systems, WHO Sri Lanka. Our host, Jimmy Rosario, a familiar face, a consultant and a founder of Sweatshop Fitness and a trainer at Luminary Learning, specializing in corporate wellness. And as always, observing silently behind is Vidushanathvitharana, founder and destiny architect of High Five Consultancy and Luminary Learning Solutions. Hopefully, he will not be forced out of his sanctuary this morning. Well, Jimmy, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Anton. Thank you very much. And a uh, wonderful morning from uh, sunny Sri Lanka to everybody out there. Uh, thank you, Sarinda, uh, Professor Nalika, and Muntaza for being here. Uh, it's a great day and a great thing to talk about, especially we are in lockdown when this is a perfect time where for a change time is on your side. And uh, this time nobody can find the excuse and say they're actually out of time. And uh, one of the first things actually we wanted to talk about was uh, the benefits and why we're being active. I've actually had the uh, uh, honor of actually working with all three of our panelists today, so Mr. Sarinda and uh, Professor Nalika as well. Uh, we've had a great time working together. I have learned a lot from them, uh, as much as any wisdom I could uh, uh, part with on my side as well, I hope. Uh, we have had quite a run over the past uh, four to six weeks uh, with regard to some people uh, trying to get active. And uh, one of the examples uh, which uh, I have taken uh, is uh, of myself, which I tried to actually spend time more with my family and be active with them. Uh, my sons are two and four, so uh, I try to get them to do all sorts of fun things, but I realize that uh, they have way more energy than us, but energy levels have changed. Uh, I've learned a lot from uh, uh, that as that as a reality check, you know, and uh, 
let's see what the day brings through uh, every day. So what I thought was today, when it comes to levels of activity, uh, usually what we usually think about is some kind of reward, even as a job or a task or anything. And uh, one of the actual rewards we actually look at when we look at activity or exercises, unfortunately not dying one is that so you know so extending life or looking younger or looking better or fitter or healthier the other things are the monetary benefits they can actually come through you can actually save on medical bills things like that and the uh, non-monetary benefits you know like uh, your levels of energy changing uh, you feel better unfortunately that's not a very measurable uh, thing we can look at and uh, so we, I actually want to start with Sarinda because uh, from his days of playing cricket and rugby, uh, rekindling those days, he's, he's, I've known him to be active for nearly a decade. And uh, how he spends uh, most of his uh, days during the lockdown. So Jimmy, you're asking me a question? Uh, yes, Sarinda, yes. Sir. Okay. How have your days been lately? Well, to me, this has been the best time ever. I mean, uh, for me personally, uh, initially I went through a bit of a you know traumatic period, wondering what to do, but then settled into a good routine. So I just want to address one thing that you said. It's about you know the fear of dying and various things. I think working out is not just about the quality of living; it's about the quality of dying as well, because you can be a really unhealthy person who kind of staggers through life and go on, and then have a sudden death or slow, painful death, whatever it may be. That's that that's not up to us, but uh, but the quality of your life till that point is what's important. And that is why older people like me need to be focusing and really um, spending a lot of time and effort on making sure that the quality of life that we have left, whatever it may be, 10 years, 50 years or whatever, I want to lead to an 100 uh, and a fit 100. That's my ambition. Uh, but that building life, uh, fitness into your lifestyle becomes absolutely important. So how I have plan my day now that I have so much time on my hand is that actually two benefits came out of this. One is having time. I can do two workouts a day. So I've broken it out where I do uh, a cardio session in the morning and then I do some weights and strength work in the evening. Um, also, the fact that I don't have the kind of access that I had to fast food in the past, which has been a really, really uh, difficult thing for me to control, uh, has now made me a little healthier because I'm eating home cooked food and I can be a little more conscious. So I've cut down the, the crap that I was eating and I'm really focusing on making sure that I maximize the time that I have to do a couple of really productive, good workouts. With my, my whole family is here. They're all locked in together and the rest of my family are fitness fanatics. My sons and my, their girlfriends and my, my partner. So uh, everybody is working out and it's a great environment for us to motivate each other and, and, and keep going. Okay, and also, do you, obviously, as an example, you are setting for the corporate world, especially your, especially MAS. Uh, can you just point out some kind of monetary, I'm sorry, some kind of benefits that the activity can bring and how this trickle down effect, like you said, did you have it on your family members and how that has reflected on people you work with as well? So, interestingly, um, what's happened is, um, it worked the other way around. While I was doing my own workout here uh, on my own, there's a group of folks from my office who have started a chat group called Slim Possible. And on that chat group, there are about 15 or 20 people and they brought me also into that. And then we gra gradually started getting momentum. Now we've got almost close to 75 or 80 people on it. Where everybody starts posting workouts. We started throwing challenges to each other. There's a 30 push-ups in 30 day challenge going on. There's a plank challenge going on. There's a skipping challenge going on. So all these challenges are being thrown. And what we have seen there is there are about 75, 80 people now who are looking at others working out under lockdown situations, comparing notes and really creating a super community that I know will continue not just during the lockdown period, but way beyond that. We started planning, OK, when we get back to work, how are we going to do this? We're going to do lunchtime workouts. We have the, uh, uh, you know, we have showers in office. So we're going to start doing lunchtime workouts. We'll do before office workouts, after office workouts, or even during office. Because if you take a work day, there's always time for somebody to take an hour off or 45 minutes off. 
and they get a workout in. So I think the learnings that we are gathering here and that kind of group that we have formed here is going to carry forward well beyond uh, this lockdown. Okay. Okay, that's really, uh, that's kind of what I want to know. Also, I was, uh, we were looking at, uh, okay, sorry about that. Got that clear. Okay, just logging in again. Okay, so we were looking at keeping this thing institutionalized. So we were looking, looking at, uh, <coughs> Uh, this wellness thing, do you think this is a bit of a controversial uh, topic I'm going to bring? Is you think like a qualification we're looking at? Is it possible to make wellness a KPI for promotion or recruitment? We always know that we always look, ask people about passion, qualifications, uh, and expertise or experience they have. But is it possible to look at being realistically being able to deliver? No, I don't think that's a very fair thing. Um, I, I, you know, unfortunately, I, I, oh, I don't think it's very fair to start judging people's work performance based on their fitness. But I think what happens is you will find that there is a direct correlation between the energy levels and the and the capabilities, uh, not capabilities, but definitely between the energy levels and the, uh, you know, um, the approach that people have when they are fit and strong and feeling confident than people have when they are not. So I don't think it can be built into a KPI. That would be very unfair. Uh, but certainly, um, I, I think it, it reflects overall and there is an impact. I need to make one correction. I got about 10 text messages from my group saying I, I read the group name out wrong. It's mission slim possible. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there guys sorted. <laughs> no, the other thing we were talking about is how you were thinking about after the lockdown is over. Uh, one of the things we usually look at some, uh, somebody who's on a 30 day diet or a 30 day workout binge, we'll just say on the 31st day, they're going to go and go and hit uh, their fast food or alcohol or sugary treats or something which they've been longing or craving for. So, for example, that past uh, day, a uh, few days ago, we could have seen how people actually uh, hit the bars and all the alcohol establishments. Uh, so what I want to actually ask uh, uh, Professor Narika is that uh, this, this change that when people want to go for this after this 30 day lockdown, how can we change this? How can we change their mindsets? So how easy or difficult is it to actually change a person from going from this lockdown, what risks are there for that uh, for them to make that behavioral change after this lockdown period is over? Yes, um, actually, um, that's a very important um, aspect that uh, we as uh, WHO and also the health sector and all all the other government sectors who are involved in this COVID response is working on. It's in technical terms, it's called risk communication and change in behavior, which is one of the main pillars of the COVID response from the and had been a main pillar from the beginning. So from the beginning, there are plans uh, on which on um, messages that should go to the public and also to uh, including children, adults, adolescents on what is expected of them, the behavioral change that is expected by the government, uh, by this whole response for them to contribute to this, uh, this effort of uh, keeping this uh, pandemic under control in Sri Lanka. And right now we are working on, because as we all know, they, there are plans to exit from this lockdown. So right now the emphasis is on how we should be uh, doing the messages and um, uh, aiming at keeping this changed behavior at an optimum because we are looking at, though we say exit, we are looking at a period of at least 12 to 18 months beyond exit where we need to keep these behaviors uh, intact to keep this pandemic under control. 
So that's a very important thing and they, it's a science. The behavioral change uh, communication is a science. There are surveys that are being conducted on what are what people know, what people's attitudes are and what they do right now. So based on what we what people find, what we find in these surveys, the messages are being crafted. So that's that's an effort that we are going through right now. OK, and uh, what can we to do to bring, say, health and fitness as part of work and working? So uh, if the WHO also uh, has any idea of how we can actually make activity inbred part of that organization and how I know the WHO also has the, has their has had uh, more than a few uh, wellness and fitness programs. Uh, MS Frida has actually done some. I have done with uh, more near up to 100 different companies that have actually worked uh, short term, long term programs. Uh, what do you think has been done uh, or what is being done? For example, with a few examples, if you can. So uh, some of the most of the audience would like to know that part uh, because they're all interested in how can we get active? Uh, people want to know what their employers or organizations, people like the WHO uh, can actually help promote this kind of activity. Yes, actually, that's one main reason that I uh, accepted this invitation. Uh, actually, we, being WHO, we have a more systematic approach to this. And um, in, in technical terms, it's called uh, promoting health through settings. You know, and we work on different settings, workplaces, cities, schools, and workplace is a setting that WHO considers, of course, based on evidences that can promote health. The, the reasons, the simple reasons given are that people spend a lot of time, most of their awake on time of a day in a workplace, most adults. Then also, if some uh, policy or a guideline comes as a workplace policy, there is so much evidence all over the world that people are more likely to uh, likely to adhere to it. And all the out there, there are now somebody was talking about indicators. Actually, there have been there are indicators which you can measure, not necessarily to determine whether whether that is going to uh, determine whether a worker gets a benefit or not, but actually to measure how how the health is improving among workers and all of them have shown that if you work through the workplaces trying to organize people to be more healthy, it is more uh, effective rather than people taking uh, the decisions on their own and working on their own individually. And another another encouraging evidence is the people, the workers who are likely to get motivated through workplaces, actually there is evidence also to say that they are able to disseminate these practices to family, uh, their communities, as uh, Sarinda just uh, explained, you know, that that ripple effect is also very well uh, documented. So if you give a give a minute, I'll just describe what we have done in the World Health Organization office in Sri Lanka. We, we initiated this concept uh, um, about six months ago um, uh, as official, you know, as officially, officially we launched a concept of a model health setting in WHO office Sri Lanka. We are located in Babalapitiya and that has several kind of items. One is, one would be we, we set up a small corner in the office which provides people uh, facilities to check themselves. You know, we, one, uh, one idea of this promotion of uh, health through workplace is trying to um, empower the workers to take on, take charge of your, their own health, not wait until you go to a doctor or for a doctor to say, this is the time for you to check your blood pressure, blood sugar, and this is what you'll be doing or what you should not be doing. So that we have brought in as an office concept. We have a small corner set up where people can do their self checking. There, there is, I'm going to share with you later on a document which we have made on out of it. 
where there is a self blood pressure checking monitor and a and a bio impedance machine which with all instructions in all three languages to say how somebody can check their own body measurements to say whether they are healthy or not most importantly not just one time the workers can register themselves in the machine and check monitor over time whether they are improving or not in parallel to this, we offer opportunities for the, the, the staff here to get engaged in um, healthy, uh, to get uh, account, 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 account to the healthy lifestyle, like physical activity. We have a, uh, we have a group whose group of trainers who conduct physical activity, mind you, that is partially funded by the office. And also there is one hour of office, like three days a week, we get one hour off from office time to get engaged in this exercise. That is to uh, build the capacity of the workers on what exercises people should be doing and also to guide them through this process. That's just one aspect. Then we to quickly run through other points of uh, like action in this healthy setting, model healthy setting in our office. We have developed, uh, as you all know, uh, meetings are part and parcel of office life. And um, invariably we, at meetings, we, we serve these snacks which are not considered healthy. So considering this problem, we also developed a small guideline, guidebook, which I also I'm going to share with you. Um, on healthy meeting snacks the concept there is at a meeting you should only be eating about 100 kilocalories or less so what we are proposing in this uh, recipe book sometimes maybe the same food that we eat but in a smaller version so that the calorie number of calories you get out of eating that is kept at just level of 100 or less because these meeting snacks are usually other than, you know, in addition to the meals that we take. So promoting meat in snacks is one thing. Uh, and also, again, related to meeting, you know, another, another opportunity we have to tell people about being physical active is to create opportunities within the meeting to be active, because sometimes meetings go on, go on for days or sometimes. So these are the kind of um, uh, different aspects that we are trying to address through this healthy work setting uh, concept in our office. Right. So that is also your culture, which is also uh, Sarinda, we were talking about MS and Nike earlier about uh, what their culture they have been bringing it in. Uh, so can you just give us uh, a just a bit of reflect on that a bit about uh, how Nike had been running it, especially as an activity based company, as a sportswear company. Yeah, JB, uh, I have had the privilege of going to the Nike campus on many occasions. And, and one thing that you see there is if you, wherever you look, there's this whole feeling of wanting to be healthy and a part of, uh, part of a healthy lifestyle. So from the food that's offered in the cafeteria to the number of options they have in terms of gyms and games that they can play, and the fact that when you go there, you constantly see people either jogging or running or going for a workout or whatever, which means that the whole culture of the organization is built around allowing people the freedom to find time to do uh, an activity, whether it's jogging or weightlifting or playing soccer or whatever it may be, uh, to keep themselves healthy. So I think it's really important that the organization, starting from the leadership, gives provides the platform like uh, Professor was saying a little while ago, provides a platform for people to become healthy. Now, having said that, there is, uh, there is this mis mis no, misunderstanding that if you put a gym in there, that everybody is going to go flooding into the gym. Mm -hmm. Gyms are not, unfortunately, gyms haven't become a part of our culture or society till recent times. So it's still looked at mm -hmm. as only for you know people who want to go and build muscle and become big and get strong and so it's not seen as a part of a daily lifestyle so what we have realized is yes you can have a small gym and have some equipment available but exactly what the professor was saying you you start looking at small things you know what what food is being served how much activity measure the step count 
we mm -hmm. got on an app right now where people can measure their step count every day and see how much they're walking, how much water are they drinking. Just little lifestyle changes like that is what's important. Because I think in Sri Lanka, especially if you take the whole fitness movement, this has been something that happened only in the last six or seven years. Before that, if you look before that, there were people who were working out without a doubt. But those were like few and far between. Now, if you take a large segment of the population is starting to pay attention. You go to the walking tracks, you see people walking on a daily basis. They're starting to pay attention. And I think even having things like WhatsApp groups, WhatsApp has been a huge benefit in many, many things. And that has been a platform where people get together and compare workouts. So there is this a bit of peer pressure, a bit of wanting to belong, and also the benefits of good health that are coming through um, where fitness is becoming a lifestyle. So organizations need to create, not at a high level and say you've got this you know, top class gym and you've got to do, go there every day, but a lifestyle of fitness, uh, uh, inherent behavior of health, that is incorporated into their daily activity. Just like the professor was saying, what do we serve at, um, at meetings? I mean, in the past, when we went to a meeting, a huge bucket of Chinese rolls would turn up and I would eat about three quarters of that. So, you know, those are the things. Serve some fruit, serve some nuts, you know, things like that, but rather than have Chinese rolls and patties and cakes and all those turning up. So those are the little changes that organizations need to start making. Um, in order to give their, uh, give their employees and uh, members of their team a healthy platform to work on. Okay, that's good. We have a question from one of our uh, viewers here at uh, Sharanya Sekram, uh, 9, 9 AM. She said, Hi, I wanted to ask about the rise of fitness influencers and how we distinguish between who is genuine and who is problematic. Okay, now they've put me on the spot here. So now I'm in a bit of trouble. Uh, uh, what I uh, wanted to know is that wanted to know from anyone uh, is always do a background check on. Um, uh, it's good. Most of these trainers are very passionate about what they know and love to do. But uh, experience and qualifications always count because you are actually having your response for people's lives here. Uh, if you don't know, always be ready to uh, say you don't know. Be able to refer somebody, uh, refer a person to somebody, and uh, because it's a big responsibility. Uh, I know there's a huge rise, and uh, there are the occasional. I, I played cricket in. I used to captain my team in 1994, so I can do this kind of scenario, uh, which is not uh, ideal because right now there's a it's it's not just about the competition because people actually know you uh, clients understand they understand things like physiology anatomy uh, why warm ups are needed like recently i actually had a quite a lengthy conversation with a client who who talks about static stretching at the end and why we shouldn't do it at the start and stuff you know like you stretch and you move instead of just do a static holding in one place. Uh, it's, it's really good to know that people want this. Uh, also, influencers uh, tend to have, uh, uh, tend to push you into a different direction. Uh, sometimes which uh, can, I wouldn't say an unrealistic goal, but they kind of try to push you towards this goal, which which can stress people out. I, 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 just, I just tell people that sometimes the good enough theory, depending on the person, uh, we have got, some clients and some corporates to lose 36 kg in six weeks. Uh, but these were boys in their 20s. Uh, we have got uh, guys to guys and girls to actually get to their targets. And also education. Uh, try and teach people what the importance of being active is. Now, like uh, Professor Nalika said, uh, body composition is very important. Lots of clients and people and just general population know what their body fat ranges should be. And it's always not about uh, losing weight uh, versus gaining muscle. So sometimes people are now understanding. So you can actually start here and you move here and then you keep increasing at a certain point. Uh, if you're only looking at your scale, you realize that you are increasing weight at a certain time and then you give up on a program. You don't go in to ask for more advice. You know, uh, there are things like that which always it's very important to teach people and always and for example Sarinda you 
uh, you know what ranges are, why things happen, how physiology works, uh, how you can plateau during a training period, how you can vary. So you know, like for example, you do your cardio in the morning, so you're energized within the day, so you can do your strength towards the evening. Then you're tired and you can go a bit easy. You don't have to be that strict on your dinner, you know. Uh, so there are lots of things where you can, uh, you should know. But always the first thing is always be wary of what this person is saying. Do, don't necessarily, it doesn't have to be a background check. But if you know, if you can check with someone else on that person's experience and how well they are versed in handling clients, uh, not just about diplomacy and stuff but then realistically about handling things, about uh, what they have done in case of an emergency, what they have as a plan B, have they looked at options and being very realistic. Uh, also, uh, just a second ago, we got uh, a question from Shivalata Sivasundaram 918. Uh, dear Mr. Sarinda, I was interested on your quote, workout during office hours and if it's in practice in Western countries, however, new to Sri Lanka. How do you think organizations in SL Sri Lanka formulate this strategy or idea from a practical perspective? Well, first and foremost, you had to put showers in your office. That's the most important thing because nobody's going to do a workout and want to come and sit in office pouring sweat in a tropical country. Uh, but OK, so that is just a little um, infrastructure thing, but the leadership has to encourage that kind of behavior. Uh, and from a personal uh, point of view, in my previous workplace, we put a gym in and we found that nobody was going during the day. It was absolutely empty. State of the art gym, absolutely empty during the day. So what I started doing was I started going and working out at two o'clock in the morning and making a bit of a song, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon and making a bit of a song and dance about it. So two to three, I'd work out three o'clock, I'd have a shower and then get back to work. So once the leadership encourages it and also even you know there is the conscious and unconscious uh, encouragement or bias that you can bring in if somebody is going to have a workout during the day and the leader says ah you're going to work out again ah, like you know if that's the kind of behavior that happens in the office people are never going to work out if somebody sees someone else going to work out and say hey i'm wait a minute I'm, i'll join you and just start becoming a part of that um, that is what's important and that has to come from leadership Leadership has to be at the forefront of this because we do live in a very hierarchical society. And unless the leader encourages and pushes this behavior, people below that are never going to do it. Okay. So you have to, it has to come from leadership. And it can uh, be done, it has been done. Okay, right. Uh, Professor Nayaka? Yeah, one more thing to add. Yes, I totally agree about the leadership. A step further, uh, what we have done is we have a yearly thing called group. Um, how do you say that? Um, we have individual objectives to be achieved uh, within a year as well as a group objective. I'm not very sure whether it's called a group, act, a team objective. That's the name, team objectives. And during the last two years, actually, we have taken on themes related to um, related to uh, promoting health of staff members and we are required at the end of the year as a team to report or jot down what things we achieved. So I, I thought that also helped and as Sarinda said, we as a group also have engaged in these global regional challenges which bring people to, to form teams and get into these competitions of how much um, physical activity that uh, as a team people uh, would uh, achieve and all that had been very fun and also actually um, uh, has given a lot of return uh, in uh, return on investing of this time and energy of the office. So totally agreed, you know, leadership and, uh, and a kind of a policy level decision of a organization that it would promote the health of the staff and promote healthy lifestyles would go a long way. Okay. There's one more question that's also just coming from the audience. How many hours after meals should you have an intense workout and does it differ from person to person? You're asking me or you're asking me? Um, <laughs> uh, do you have any insights on that? Can just... Is the question on how many hours afterwards? 
Uh, how many hours after a meal should you have an intense workout? There is no. Um, that's like. Uh, uh, there is no recommended timing in relation to meals. The minimum requirement that uh, according to the medical, the WHO recommendation of a minimum requirement of physical activity is the mo if you engage in moderate activities, that is the things like uh, light jogging, uh, brisk walking or kind of gardening, one should acquire a total period of 30 minutes of uh, minimum uh, the moderate type of uh, exercises per day for at least five days a week to achieve a level of physical activity which would protect your heart you know to be healthy this is uh, so let me tell you again if it is in the moderate category a person uh, any adult would need 150 minutes of physical activity per week. It can be, and I said it can be done as 30 minutes for five days, but at least 10 minutes as, as at a stretch. And if you are uh, a person who can do vigorous type of physical activity, the minimum requirement is actually 75 minutes per day. And that is very small because 30 minutes per day for five days of the week, I think anybody can put it. So that is our basis of recommendation for somebody to keep healthy, to keep your heart healthy. But if people have other goals like uh, losing weight, the recommendations would differ and you we would need a personalized kind of instructions on that. And Sarinda, I'm also assuming that your 2 p.m. workout is a pre-lunch workout. <laughs> Well, the 2 p.m. workout is to help me not eat much. So it had uh, it had two uh, benefits. Uh, one was it kept me in check to make sure that I didn't stuff my face too much at lunchtime. And uh, two, it got a, a decent workout in. Uh, also, that I picked that time because that used to be the time that during my day I was flattest. I mean, I felt the, the least energetic and, and least productive uh, from a work point of view. So this way, during that time, I went and boosted my energy levels up a little bit, got a good workout in and came back charged for another two or three hours at the end of the day. Um, going back to the, the whole thing of, you know, how much time after a workout, I, I think it, as long as you're comfortable, you're fine. I mean, the worst that can happen is your lunch will come out or your dinner will come out and you just keep going. You're not going to die just because uh, you you ate too much. Uh, the, 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 the Another really important thing when you're looking at, uh, you know, how much to eat and how much to work out, as the professor was saying, it has a lot to do with what your objectives are. And for somebody like me, I have a huge problem with my weight. I can fluctuate, Jimmy, as you know, my fluctuation is 15 kilos. My peak is 15 kilos uh, at 100 kilos. And when I'm really in great shape, I'm at 85 kilos. So um, that is a massive fluctuation. That has simply got to do with one thing, is I can't keep my mouth shut. I eat too much. Simple. Because workouts don't vary much. So the correlationship between your body reacting to food and, and workout is something that you need to understand. And that is something that has worked really well for me during the lockdown. I've really started to understand how my body reacts to bad food. Okay. And also, do you feel that it's never too late to set goals during this period? Hell no. Why, why would it be too late? I mean, it's never too late. I mean, people, people in their 60s and 70s are doing intense CrossFit. And they're doing insane stuff. I, I think this whole fallacy that you've got to slow down as you get older, that's rubbish. That has been tossed out of the window. I'm lifting more weights now than I ever did. My personal best um, uh, uh, deadlift and squat is now. And I'm 56. You know? So uh, it's just a mindset. And it's just about getting your body. You can't suddenly go and stack 400 pounds and try to do something. You build it up. You gradually build it up. But it's really important that you realize that if you make your body work, it'll work. Yeah. If you sit down and wait and expect to get in shape by, you know, not doing anything, forget it. It's not going to happen. So it's a, uh, you know, uh, how, however much work you put in, you're going to get the rewards for it. Correct. This is the only thing they say that you can't cheat at. You can't look in at the next no, person. You can't. You can't. Absolutely. So you you can't. You have to. The work has, nobody else can do this homework for you. Correct. And so there's the consistency and the commitment issue. Uh, Absolutely.
so uh, that will lead to so the plan stick with the plan and also the uh, the the other question about hydration uh, professor you are talking about uh, professor nalika was talking about some uh, hydration uh, guidelines do you have any that we can actually put for active or non active uh, individuals uh, hi Hydration actually is a general guide. At least uh, three to four liters of water a day. The guidelines that I I was talking about, we have several guidelines. You know that is a co-function of WHO. But we have localized guidelines. One that I was talking about was um, guidelines on meeting snacks, which I am really keen to pass on to everybody through email. We have a soft copy version. Okay. Uh, and also we have a, developed a guideline to sri lanka on um, promoting health at workplace actually it talks about everything that we are talking about now about and also it uh, it offers the help of who staff in sri lanka if any work setting wants to set up a, or to initiate to plan a kind of a systematic um, health promotional program at their workplaces so both of the, both these guidelines i i'm ready to share okay good also there's another one with uh, uh, being healthy being fit and looking good this is a very dicey question that everybody wants to know if if they can just exercise <laughs> enough sarin just I can. I, lots of uh, lots of uh, lots of ladies. I come to. I just. I'm. I'm a size A. I want to get into a size B. That's my goal. So, Jimmy, each person has a different aspiration and different reason for working out. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to look good. Uh, I think making you know wanting to look good, people feel good as a result of looking good. So it's it's fine. Whatever your target may be, whether you want to look good, fit into a particular dress size, wear a particular waist size, fine. make that your goal but have a proper plan to get there and stay there otherwise you have to have two different sets of clothes the fat clothes and the thin clothes you know and depending on whether it's christmas time or half way through the year you wear whichever the 85 kg suits and 100 kg suits absolutely i've thrown all the hundreds out and now i'm sticking with the 85 to 90 uh, but what's important is to give yourself whatever motivates you whatever motivates you it's fine make that your goal and go for it but have a goal so if it's a weight target if it's a you know wanting to do a triathlon or wanting to be able to run up the stairs without huffing and puffing or whatever it may be set yourself a goal and achieve that goal once you have achieved that goal always keep trying to edge it forward little bit little bit little bit you know and and set yourself uh, you you have to keep striving for improve and again i'm going back to the whole age thing is that when people get older they think okay i used to lift this when i was 25 so i i shouldn't be doing this now rubbish if you can lift it lift it if you can you know run it run it if you can climb it climb it as long as your body is functioning and working and you're not damaging yourself keep pushing keep going okay okay that's that's a great question thanks anit and also professor uh, we need to understand that just looking good doesn't necessarily mean you are healthy also is there a correlation there um so really actually um are you thinking of people who are very thin but do not have the correct proportion of muscle to fat yeah that's possible that is also possible so uh, necessarily actually what we recommend is to have the correct body proportions firstly a correct weight according to your height and also the correct proportion of fat to muscle ratio i want also want to reiterate the uh, uh, sarinder's point about age not being a barrier for the amount of uh, physical activity recommendation that is true because the recommendation of who for when i say adults there is no age limit that is the minimum requirement and we stress on this minimum requirement uh, because and also about having personal goals because many people many ladies they they do just do the minimum requirement what we prescribe and get very disheartened saying they never lost their weight so because people give up on that 
we we make it a point to say this is the minimum requirement to keep your heart healthy but if you want to look good if you want to lose weight then it's a personalized goal and everybody even if even if your goal is just to keep your heart healthy you have to have your goal set as everybody yes sarin also mentioned because otherwise if you don't have your goal set and if you think just by doing the minimum requirement that you'll get your weight uh, you lose your weight then soon people are going to get discouraged so this is the message we need to say you have to have your uh, personal goal but this is the minimum requirement but at least keep to that now all any all adults the requirement i said was moderate exercise 150 minutes a week for children it's double for children if it's moderate exercise it is 300 minutes per week okay thanks also uh, uh mutasa is well is now joining us uh he's uh, we apologize for that breakdown we just had uh mutasa can you hear us are we good yes i i can yes i'm so sorry about the delay there was that's a lot of technology problems that's all good very good morning to you mutasa uh we straight want to throw you in. Uh, we were actually discussing about your previous uh, sports endeavors where you actually used to be a uh, top ranking squash player in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, so, I, the first question we're going to throw you in, you know, hit you really hard with the first one. But uh, what we have noticed for most of our corporate biggest loser programs is that we we'll just say it's a three month program in the first month is the biggest loss so the consistency and con commitment is biggest in the first few periods so can you tell us what your secret was for keeping at it even so then five years ago uh, I think we, uh, we resolved to you know we made a bold ambition as an organization to have the heaviest workforce in the country and so uh, extremely uh, you know uh, crazy goal because at the time of start, so we thought we should uh, do a couple of things. We, we can start uh, a globally and locally uh, to see how it could help us because we had uh, and today it's over 8,000. Uh, so how do you, how you actually even, you know, when it's hard to motivate in a small team, how do you make interventions at that scale? Uh, so the first thing is we actually ask employees, what do you want? What do you, what is your idea of health? Or what, what, what do you, what do you want as a organization for us to do? What are the problems that you face? Uh, and and uh, taking by inputs and the first inputs, we kind of realized that there were four big problems that we had, and we had to commit ourselves to, which is um, level of stress that we were facing. Uh, and we had um, uh, issues with it. The, uh, the uh, activity, uh, nutrition, uh, and health and safety at the workplace. And so we thought we have to measure where we are. And so, uh, with the help of our hospitals, we actually uh, screened almost 4,000 people. Uh, and that is huge because we promote the idea of screening. People want and really, uh, you know, even if it was absolutely free, it was still a challenge to motivate people why you have to screen. And we also committed a, large, a very substantial amount of money as a fund, uh, as a health wellness fund uh, that we are going to use just for them to do these things. And so, when people realized, uh, for the first time, there were so many who didn't realize they had high blood pressure. Uh, it's quite aghast at the number of, uh, you know, at how many people were doing less than the from 180 to 150 minutes exercise per week. It was like almost 60%. Uh, this was five years ago. Uh, uh, compared to the national average, national average from things like cholesterol, smoking, uh, blood pressure, uh, we don't have, because, you know, being corporate, uh, it's, a bit, uh, it's a more intense environment. And uh, and therefore, so the first thing was actually getting people to know where they are, 
and then the very high people who are very high risk. Uh, we actually got one on one medical for, to actually speak to them. Because some of the medication, some of it required, uh, you know, uh, an understanding of what that, what, what the effect of that was. Uh, so these were, the, this was the, uh, this was the start, and then we used uh, uh, so Shaw, uh, you helped us in one of our programs, which was about, uh, which was called Fit for Life. Uh, you know, over a period of time, we had about you know 200 people over the for three years that lost about 180 yeah. kilos. Yes. Uh, but it was also it mainly the creation of a culture, a setting culture of wellness in the group, and that started from all of us at the top, from our group to about the company. Uh, off the top, we, we did stuff ourselves. We we were. Uh, you know, in the garden of the workhouse, we, we, we would have meetings. Uh, we would, uh, in, on, on for some people who were really obese, uh, you know, our, our MD is saying, that's all we want you to do. We just want you to lose weight. We don't want you to do anything else. Uh, and I think the, 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 the you know, obviously, people were very, they, they felt the boss cares so much. Uh, actually increased on the way of work. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, not to talk about uh, what we've been doing. Um, tell me where you feel I should start and where I should stop. Okay. That's good. Okay. So, and also, Sandra, we have uh, just uh, just a quick one uh, to about how to be the best version of yourself physically. Uh, what tips would uh, you have for people to really go for it? So again, that was uh, that I, I think I wrote that somewhere recently uh, about being trying to be the best version of yourself. I think uh, you know, given a lockdown situation, let's go into where we are right now. Uh, we've got this period of time where you can really spend time not only on your physical activity but on your mental side as well. I think there's a strong correlation between your um, mental health as well as your physical health. So uh, one of the things that I have really spent time doing, and this is going to sound a little weird, but I really sat down and did almost an audit of myself. Who am I as a person? What am I as a person? And then I started looking at the physical aspect of it, my approach to work, my approach to my family, my approach to life, my, my retirement plans, all that, and just started mapping out how can I be a better version of myself? That's simply that. So when it comes to physical fitness also, you can do an audit of what your capabilities are. How far can you run? How far can you swim? How, can, how much can you hold a plank? How many push-ups? Whatever. Set yourself some targets and say, okay, in two weeks, I'm going to try and better this by this much. You know, you don't have body fat measurements and all that stuff right now. So if you, if you look at all those things, um, uh, at home, not everybody has those measurements, but it's, uh, you certainly do have the ability to set yourself a target and say, I can do 20 push-ups today. I'm going to do 50 at the end of the month and start working. So you're, you're building into your daily routine a system of betterment. Okay. Okay, and in your two best practices, would you, what would you say, for example, Sarin? Well, eating less has been the biggest because I have been a person who I'm like a caterpillar. I like to eat the whole day. So what I've done is now I've started surrounding myself one with healthy snacks. Uh, I run from every time my kids open a box of brownies. Those guys are blessed with really low body fat and a high metabolism. I'm not. Um, I'm like a panda when it, if I start eating. So um, I have to stay away from the foods. That's uh, the, the sweets. That's something that I have done. And the other thing is I've now set myself a challenge of one month without alcohol. And those who know me know how difficult that is going to be for me. Uh, but I set myself, I've lasted one day. Uh, so today is day two. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> All right, that's good. Uh, any, any best practices from uh, Professor Nalika? Um, uh, I also like, you know, personally, I have a um, uh, challenge for physical activity. You know, while in office, it was uh, like before the COVID uh, situation, it was easy because we have uh, actually I have a I have somebody who promotes everybody in my workplace in who's working next to my workstation. 
is the person who would promote us and somehow drag all of us on the physical activity day to participate. But now we are doing with the with the, working with the critical staff. And, but you know she has made uh, made use of this opportunity and we now run a online class. So my target personally is at least keep to the minimum uh, physical activity requirement that I have. Uh, I I just uh, I just told you about the WHO recommendation. Five days, 30 minutes a week. And I have been successful over the past few months to somehow keep to that. Okay. Jimmy, I think if I may if I may jump in here, the yeah. one thing during this period is since time can become very fluid, since you have time to you know drift around doing all kinds of stuff, set yourself a routine. Correct. Mm -hmm. Set yourself a daily routine and say, at this time I will work out, at this time I will read, at this time I will rest. Otherwise, the temptation to be hanging on a mobile phone or watching Netflix is going to overcome everything else. So it's really important that you set yourself a, a good routine and some strict measures of discipline, like in my case, my diet and my alcohol consumption. So, um, you know, those are things that are vital at a time like this. Otherwise, it's very easy to just kind of drift away. Okay. Totally agreed. Okay. Uh, Mutasa, anyway, uh, best practices from you? Uh, yeah, for me, my focus really has been the mental side on, on uh, you know, uh, handling anxiety because we are in health, health and so we are really quite full on trying to manage uh, essential services from us from home, some of us from our factory, um, and keeping our safe. So, uh, what I've actually started doing this last month is intensifying my yoga. Um, uh, I've uh, oh, found that can do pretty big yoga online uh, with online support. Uh, breathing, prana, uh, a bit of meditation um, has been uh, very good. And like Sainda says, uh, you know, I have a strict routine. I try to get as much exercise as possible done first thing in the morning, then, you know, dress like I'm. Office. Um, I'm, I'm working for. I uh, I just come to office, and then you know uh, take a break for lunch. And keep going early in the evening. I try just to have a lane so I can walk down the lane in the evenings, um, and you know try and do that for the day thing. Uh, uh, you're sitting too long at home. And just one last question, uh, starting the what is uh, this advice for leaders uh, to bring fitness and wellness into an organization. What what advice can you give them? Firstly, I think everybody needs to understand and believe that there is a good correlation between productivity and well-being. Like, for example, if you have a healthy workforce, that your productivity and your uh, environment, your workplace is going to be um, much better. The second thing is try not to go into extreme activities. Invariably, what we do is we set ourselves things of like saying you're going to have a weight loss challenge or, you know, you're going to have like a marathon or, you know, some something like that, which alienates 90% of your staff. Find some kind of mid-level activity, something that you can do or for as many people as possible. You have to, whatever program you bring in, make it as inclusive as possible. If people want to go into extreme workouts and, you know, do things like CrossFit or, you know, triathlons or marathons or whatever it may or extreme uh, active any extreme activity they can do that in their private time the organization needs to provide a platform and we have we actually we've been working with Murtaza's, Murtaza's team at Hema's to create a, a very uh, a kind of balanced platform where it approaches things like how much water how much food what are you eating how many steps are you taking what's your activity level just monitoring the basics and making sure people are upping their game just a little bit and being conscious of what they are uh, putting into their body. So those little measures are the things that are important. Not putting a CrossFit gym in your, uh, in your office or making everybody run uh, 10 kilometers. I think that balance, the balance of having a, uh, like a middle path approach to fitness in an office is where you're going to hit the biggest chunk of your staff. And that is what's important. And also the commitment has to be there from leadership and leadership has to lead by example. I think, yeah, your 
a pretty good example in that case. Uh, and uh, so um, I'm afraid we have to wind up right now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nalika, for your time and uh, being online and connected and for your contributions made. We also want to thank Sarinda for being here and he's been connecting with us over the past. I've known him over nearly a decade and he's been a great example to uh, not only his organization but to all the others he's worked out with, including the trainers. Murtaza has, uh, for example, uh, he's been uh, not uh, checking up on his staff by the hundreds, but by the thousands, and how he's been uh, really on the ball when it came to really putting his money where his mouth is and making the uh, company a better place. It truly has uh, really worked on genuinely to make it the uh, best, healthiest workplace in Sri Lanka. Uh, so I also want to thank our viewers. Uh, for being here and all the questions they had and all the input, I'm sure they were answered to the best of our abilities. And uh, over to you, Anton. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Sarinda, Professor Nalika and Mursaza for the upbeat and informative session this morning. Thank you for your time and insight. And Jimmy, thank you for flexing that conversation. Staying motivated equals staying productive. I think today's conversation centered around tips and ideas for staying both energetic and motivated. So we all do understand that we are going through something new as individuals and as Sarandha brought out as organizations surrounded by unknowns and the decisions of all types, which leaves a mark on the way we drive things forward. We may as well focus our efforts in making informed and gainful decisions that will benefit us in the short to long term and when everything goes back to normal. So why not start with fitness and health, which will make all the difference. We hope this webinar offered you much in terms of food for thought and motivation to take the next step towards health, your health. On that note, I'd like to thank our technology partners H1 for making this webinar series a breeze with their expert staff on hand who have been professional and accommodating. Thank you guys for a great job. Today you've tuned in to the fifth of the 12th topic lineup. And as we draw to the end of this week, let me remind you, um, we've got Monday morning a session on keeping employees engaged during a crisis, a case study from around the world. And our panel for Monday morning will be Darshana Senivaratna, Manager Talent Management, MAS Lini Aqua, Tushari Pereira, Director Human Resources, AIA Insurance, Sarat Kumar, Executive Director, Human Resource and Administration at Camsol Lostra, and Upavika Samarakun, Head of Human Resource at Hemas Holdings. Remember to log in at 9 a.m. 27th April, Monday. A quick reminder, footage from today's session will be up on our social media this weekend. Good morning to all. Enjoy the rest of the day. Stay safe and stay productive. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.